Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of a special advocacy town hall series for our Ontario members. My name is Rich Prophet, and I'm the chair of the board of RTO ERO. We are a bilingual trusted voice on healthy active living in the retirement journey. We work with our members and partners to advocate for critical policy improvements to address urgent needs now and create a more secure and compassionate future for everyone. We had a great turnout for our first town hall event last Thursday. If you missed the event uh, on senior strategy, check out on our YouTube channel for the recording. During today's town hall session, we will hear from representatives from three of Ontario's main political parties as we address one of our key advocacy issues, geriatric healthcare. As we begin the event, I would like to ask Anne Gerson, our bilingual senior specialist from the marketing and communications team to share the land acknowledgement for us in English and French. She will also provide active offer in French during the Q&A portion of the event. Anne? Thank you, Rich. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, sorry, and the Wendat peoples, which is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work and the contribution of all indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Je m'adresse à vous aujourd'hui du territoire traditionnel de nombreuses nations, incluant les peuples Mississauga de Crédit, Anishinaabeg, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee et Wendat. Ce territoire abrite aujourd'hui de nombreux membres des peuples des Premières Nations Inuit et Métis. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Merci. Thank you, Miigwech. As Rich mentioned, I will provide active offer for any participants who wish to ask questions or, or have information related in French. Throughout the town hall, feel free to use a Q&A box to submit your questions for our panelists. Comme Rich l'a mentionné, je suis ici pour assurer une offre active à tous les participants qui souhaitent poser des questions ou se faire relayer des informations en français. Tout au long de cette séance de discussion, n'hésitez pas à soumettre vos questions à nos panélistes en utilisant la boîte de discussion QER. Enjoy your town hall. Rich, Rich, can I remind you to put your video on? There we go. It's on. Okay. Thanks, Anne. I'm excited to hear from our guests today to learn more about their party's stance on geriatric health care. We invited representatives from the four main parties in Ontario to participate in our town hall events to help us prepare for the upcoming election on June the 2nd. Unfortunately, after extensive outreach to the PC Party of Ontario, we have yet to hear back from their office regarding our town hall events. We are thankful to the three parties who kindly accepted our invitation and provided representatives to speak with us and address our questions. Today, we are talking about geriatric health care. We need to address how the government will support the needs of older adults. Some of the challenges in geriatric health care include a shortage of geriatricians, the lack of a national plan or standards for long-term care homes, and also the ability to help older adults remain in their homes and communities for as long as possible. Representatives joining us today are MPP France Jelena, health critic and representative for the Ontario New Democratic Party, Marlene Spruitt, healthcare critic and Ontario Green Party candidate for Lanark Frontenac, Frontenac Kingston, and Dr. Nathan Stahl, Liberal Party of Ontario candidate for Toronto St. Paul's. In our discussion with the panelists today, we would like to know. How will your party support healthy aging? 
How can your party provide increased training in geriatric health care? And what is your plan for compassionate elder care in long-term care homes and the community? Each panelist will have 10 minutes to introduce themselves and speak about their party's position on the issue of ensuring that the needs of older adults are met. RTO ERO members and guests, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions in English or French. We will try to get to as many as possible following the presentation. We will start with MPP, France Jelena from the Ontario New Democratic Party. France? Sorry, France, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> you would think that after 4,000 Zoom, I would get that down, but no. So thank you, Rick. And thank you to all of the members of the Retired Teachers of Ontario, Les Enseignants, enseignantes à la Retraite de l'Ontario, uh, to join us today. Um, I must say uh, that I love the title of your white paper, Practice Properly. Healthcare is not a business at all, but a calling. And you will see that this value is uh, transplanted everywhere into the uh, New Democrat platform. Um, we, the Ontario New Democrat, we released our platform on uh, elder care called Aging Ontarians Deserve the Best back in October. So if you go to our website, it is available in English and in French, and you can see all of the, what we intend to do if and when we form government on June 2nd. Um, I have to start by saying that Aging is not a disease. Aging is a part of life, a beautiful part of life, a part of life that should be valued and accommodated. Uh, but in our society today, we see a lot of ageism. And no matter what ism it is, sexism, ageism, nothing good comes of that. So this also has to be addressed. Um, so I will go through um, the different parts of our platforms um, for you. Number one is we will overhaul home care so that we can help people stay home longer. I just came back from a luncheon at uh, Club d'Age d'Art de la Vallée, a francophone uh, old age club. And um, if you ask the hundreds of people that were there, many of them in their 80s and their 90s, how many of you are looking forward to go into a long-term care home? Nobody does. They want to stay home. How do you make sure that people stay home? Well, you build a not-for-profit home care system, home and community care system that meets the needs of the people, that help them age at home with respect and dignity. Can we do this? Yes, absolutely. Right now in my writing in Nickel Belt, it doesn't matter where you score on, because when they come and assess you for home care, they will give you a score. It doesn't matter if you score 27 or 18, all you get are two baths a week. That's it, that's all. You may need help to uh, get out of bed, to uh, take your medications, help preparing your food. It doesn't matter what you need, that's all that is available to you. This is not acceptable to us. We will make a basket of service available to all, no matter where they live in the province, so that it meets their needs. And their needs may very well be that they need somebody to help with the grocery shopping or help with the cooking or help with the cleaning or help with the medication or help transfer from bed to, to wheelchair, wheelchair back to your bed, no matter what it is. And you will see a little bit later on in the presentation as to how we will get that done. Um, and right now in Ontario, our home care system is dominated by three, three, three and a half, almost four big um, private chain uh, that offers, um, what can I say, the minimum that they can to meet very low standard and requirement, which means that every single day, our home care system fails more people than it helps. 
but we still spend $3.2 billion. A lot of that money goes straight into the profit of the shareholders and never reaches the homes of the people who need this. The NDP will change this. We will move away from the for-profit home care delivery to a not-for-profit. Second is uh, change our long-term care home. Uh, for anybody who follows long-term care, you'll know that since 2016, we have been putting forward motions to bring in a minimum standards of four hours of hands-on care. When the Liberals were in power uh, in 2007, they changed the Long-Term Care Home Act. We used to have a minimum standard of 2.25 hours of hands-on care. Then the Liberal came and said, oh, we don't want to put the standard in the law. We'll put it in regulation. And well, fast forward to 2022, we do not have a minimum standards of hands-on care. Things have not gone better, they have gone worse, and we don't have a way to report. I used to file freedom of access of information every three months, and I would know exactly what's the hands-on care in all of the 578 long-term care home in Ontario. None of that is available. We will bring transparency. We will bring accountability. We have a bill called Transparency and Accountability in Healthcare System that will show us where is the money going? Why is it that extended care, that private long-term care home provider, was able to give $300 million to their shareholders? How much of that money could have stayed and helped people in long-term care receive better care. So 4.1 hours of hands-on care is a minimum. It will be mandated. It will have to be provided. It will have to be reported for every single home on, on a transparent way so that everybody can see what is going on. The next is that um, we will move away from Ontario right now has 78,000 long-term care beds, all in multiply of 32. So they have 32, 64, 128 beds. They're a great big institution. That's what our long-term care home looks like. We want to move away from this. If you look at what happened in Eastern Europe almost 30, 40 years ago, they haven't built any new long-term care home. What they have is small, what looks like family homes in family neighborhoods that can hold six to 10 people. So you allow people to age in place. First, you support them in their own home as long as you can. Once it's no longer feasible to support them in their own home, they can move to those small long-term care home. It doesn't matter if you come from a little community like Killarney or Gogama in, in my community that is not big enough to have a long-term care home, you will be able to stay home and have the 24 seven care that you need. You will be able to stay there with your spouse because spousal reunification is important to us. We've had a bill on the docket called until death do us part to make sure that couples who have been together for 60 years, celebrated 70 years of marriage, one goes into long-term care and the other one cannot follow no more of this. You want to stay with your spouse, you'll be allowed to stay with your spouse. How do we do this? The main part, and that's the fourth part of our plan, is that we make PSW jobs career. What do we mean by that? Well, first, you offer permanent, full-time, well-paid, with benefits, with pension plan, with sick days, and with a workload that a human being can handle. You take the mostly part-time, with no job security, with no benefits that exist now, and you change this to uh, some, a career that people want to do. There are, in my community, hundreds of PSWs who don't work in their field anymore. Why? Because at the end of the month, they cannot pay the rent and feed their kids. It's as simple as that. They are good at what they do. They went to school because they wanted to be a PSW. They love what they do, but they cannot make a living at doing that job. That has to change. For some of you uh, will remember 
that we did something very similar to nurses. Nurses never used to be that good of a job before. We mandated hospital to have 75% of their nursing jobs to be full-time. We will do the same thing in long-term care for nurses, but also RPNs and uh, PSW so that we create good jobs. Once it is feasible for people to make ends meet working in home care, in long-term care, it will be a whole lot easier to make those new vision uh, a reality. Part five of our plan is to make caregivers partners. What does that mean? Um, you have seen through uh, the uh, COVID uh, that uh, oftentimes uh, people in long-term care were isolated. They were not allowed to see their loved ones. Uh, we will make a law that they have to let you in. And Rick, if you're back on, that's because I have 30 seconds. No, you're back out. Okay. Uh, then uh, those small homes that we are talking about, we will make sure that they are culturally sensitive. Whether you are on a First Nations community, c'était dans une communauté francophone, ce sera une petite maison francophone, dans un quartier francophone. Uh, if you are of uh, Asian descent, uh, it will be culturally, linguistically, uh, making sure that we meet your needs. Um, I'll do a little parenthesis here to say, if you look at who lives in our long-term care home now, 90% of the people in long-term care have cognitive uh, decline. Uh, two thirds have a diagnosis of dementia and one third have uh, Alzheimer. I want everyone to realize that people with cognitive decline, people with uh, um, dementia, are a big part of our community. They have a lot to teach us. If we can continue to have access for our children to continue to have access to people in our community who face dementia, you teach your community empathy. You teach the community how to live in the present. You teach the community how to be patient. Those are all very important life lessons that people with dementia are really good at teaching us. Don't put them in big institution far away from us. Let them be part of our community. Let them be part of our lives. We will all benefit. Support them? Yes, absolutely. They need the support to be respected, to, let, to live with dignity? Yes, but don't put them away. Let them be part of our society. Our society will be better for it. So the next uh, part is to clear the wait list. Uh, so uh, for anybody who goes online, you will see that there are now, we have 78,000 beds and there are 38,000 people waiting for a long-term care beds. Uh, our home care system has more people on the wait list than there are people receiving care. We have to do better. Um, does, that, does that mean we need uh, more investment? Yes. And the NDP is committed to make that investment, to be respectful of our seniors and to provide quality care. Uh, we also will bring in new, um, stronger protection and accountability. Uh, there are a lot of uh, family councils, uh, patients councils in, in different long-term care homes, uh, but they don't have much of a voice. A lot of them would like to have access before they make their choice as to which long-term care home do I want to go to, they would like to know uh, what's the staffing ratio in that long-term care home. Nobody can tell them, we will. They would like to know how, much, how many acts of aggression took place in that long-term care home. That information is really, really hard to get years down the road we will make that information available. We will make information that matters to the people, to their family, uh, so that they can make uh, enlightened decisions. And we, as I said, will transfer from a mainly for-profit long-term care system to a not-for-profit so that every uh, taxpayer's dollar invested into long-term care goes to the bedside not to the shareholders, uh, not to the high administrators of, uh, of a number of companies who own long-term care homes, uh, but to the staff who 
and the people who lives there and works there. Because in long-term care, uh, really, the quality of care is directly linked to the continuity of care. If you have to, pardon my language, strip naked in front of a different stranger every day when you receive your bath, um, it won't take long that you're not going to want to have a bath anymore because this is degrading. But if you have a familiar face, somebody you know, somebody you trust, then the care, the quality of care increased dramatically. Continuity of care is directly linked to continuity of caregivers. And how do you get this? It is not through more temp agencies that come and work in our long-term care home. It is through making PSW jobs career. It is through re, uh, respecting uh, RPNs, RN, and nurse practitioners, as well as physicians who work in those facilities uh, by giving them a career, not part-time jobs uh, that they have to put together two or three part-time jobs to make ends meet. We also have a big emphasis on uh, teaching. Uh, so I'll make again a little parenthesis. Did you know that right now in Ontario, we have 15,000 nurses that are internationally trained that are not allowed to practice. And the steps and hurdles that they have to go through before they get their license assessed to see if they have uh, the qualifications to be a nurse in Ontario will take years. Many of them give up uh, before the process is finished. We have, again, a bill that has been tabled that will make this process. We want to absolutely check on the qualification of those people to make sure that they are qualified to be an, a registered practical nurse, a registered nurse, a nurse practitioners in Ontario, and make sure that they are allowed to practice uh, so that we have enough uh, to meet the needs, no matter if you live in northern rural area like I do, or if you uh, are looking after um, a, uh, a group of the francophone <laughs> qui voudrait être servi en français. Uh, so uh, very important to look at the international train, not only for nurses, we also have many physicians who are in the same uh, cumbersome process. Could we you wrap it up, sure uh, Anne, please, uh, France, please? I would have much more to say. Uh, but uh, I will be happy to take your question. Ça me ferait extrêmement plaisir de vous répondre à vos questions en français ou en anglais. Uh, la plateforme est là, en ligne. Vous pouvez aller la voir et uh, je vous encourage de faire ça. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Jimmy Wedge. Thank you, France. And now Marlene Spruitt from the Ontario Green Party candidate for Lanark, Frontenac and Kingston. Marlene? Hi, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you to all the people online that are joining us today. Uh, the Green Party has a vision for an Ontario that cares for its people, all of its people, regardless of their age, and the planet that we live in. As we all age, we should be able to expect that we can be treated with dignity and appreciated for our contributions to society. Most of us, as France has mentioned, prefer to age in our own homes, and actually we prefer to die there. And since that is our first choice, it should also be the priority of our elder care system. We are aware that as we live longer lives, there'll be an increased demand on the healthcare system. However, easy and prompt access to restorative rehabilitation services will prevent further deterioration in any of our functioning and contribute to us maintaining active lifestyles and placing further demands on the system. Current backlogs exist for many services that seniors need in the community. 52,000 people are waiting for a knee replacement. That's about a 30 month wait list. 22,000 are waiting for hip replacements, about a 19 month wait list. 108,000 are waiting for cataract surgery, 25 months. And many of those seniors are waiting for years on these lists, in pain, with difficulty mobilizing, or unable to participate fully in the activities that they might enjoy with their family 
or in their communities. So maintaining their functional ability is critical during their aging process. And as an individual deteriorates further while waiting on these lists, it will be more difficult and expensive to regain their previous level of functioning. We need to invest in the system to eliminate these wait lists. We often think of seniors as a homogeneous group and we label them as vulnerable, that the ageism that France has also referred to. However, many of them are still working. The other day I was listening to a TVO um, documentary and Bob Ray at, happened to mention that he was 73 years old, still actively involved, work at the UN, uh, particularly at this time focused on the war in Ukraine. Some seniors are retired, but most of them are still actively involved in their community in recreational pursuits from curling clubs to golf courses. They're often fundraising for charitable organizations or delivering Meals on Wheels to other seniors. They may actually be supporting their family, their children, or their grandchildren. Many of them are actually financially comfortable, but others are not. So in many ways, our seniors are a group as diverse as the non-senior demographic. However, what they all have in common is the need to know that their healthcare system will be there for them when they need it. Consequently, our aging strategy is there to meet, is, will be able to meet the needs of people where they are at and be flexible to the diverse set of needs of this wide variety of seniors. We need to continue to design and build accessible communities that everyone, regardless of their age or ability, can navigate in. We need to provide much more supportive and transitional housing for people of all ages. We need to improve transportation options, especially in rural areas, and they need to be affordable. We need to be flexible about co-housing options so that seniors and others can share accommodation, support each other, and maintain social interaction. In many jurisdictions, when a group of seniors have tried to get together to uh, build a house that three or four couples could share or, or units that could be joined, the zoning uh, permits don't allow them to do so. We need to be more flexible about that. And we also need to provide full service, publicly funded healthcare that includes drugs, dental, vision, hearing, and rehabilitation services that would include physio and occupational therapy. And we need much more extensive home care and outpatient services that are available to everyone everywhere in the province. This would include specialized supports for individuals with dementia and the families that care for them, as well as palliative care. That's the community, and then there's long-term care. The pandemic has magnified the cracks that existed in our long-term care, long long care system, and actually in our healthcare system in general, and Ontario has failed our elders. It's been actually quite appalling to watch the stories come out of uh, various long-term care homes during the past two years. Successive governments have failed to invest in and monitor the quality of the care that's delivered in those homes. A long-term care home is not the first choice of our aging seniors, but if their needs cannot be met in their own homes, they should not then be treated as second-class citizens when they move into care. Our long-term care homes need to be primarily a residence, not an institution, where individuals enjoy living and working, where employees of those institutions are valued and can take the time required to meet the individual needs of all residents. 
the four hours of care needs to start tomorrow. The Green Party long-term care revitalization plan would build another 55,000 beds by 2035. These additional beds would alleviate pressure on hospitals by providing appropriate living arrangements for those that might be languishing in hospitals currently labeled as alternative level of care. We would discontinue issuing new licenses to for-profit long-term care home operators and eventually phase out all for-profit long-term care homes. The for-profit long-term care system paid out $171 million in dividends to its stakeholders in 2020 alone. 171 million that could have remained in the system, providing more PPE to staff and more care to residents. We need to restore dignity to our elders and put care and compassion ahead of profits. The Green Party would expand allied health services, such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and social work to one hour a day for long-term care home residents. We would also ensure that all employees are provided with professional development in topics such as behavior management, dementia, and palliative care. We would prioritize licensed proposals for small community-based long-term care homes, beds that might have 10 or 12, so that people could reside in a long-term care home that was close to where they used to live and close to family and friends. And the Green Party would review the funding of long-term care homes to ensure that nursing and personal care meets the needs of the individual resident not a standard formula for every single individual there, but very individualized plans. And that staffing plans would ensure consistency of care by maintaining more full-time nurses and full-time PSWs. Ontario's per capita spending on healthcare is about 8% lower than all the other pro, uh, out the, than the average of all the other provinces in Ontario, according to the Canadian Institute of Health and Informatics. Decades of cost cutting in the name of efficiency by previous governments have resulted in the crisis that we see today. We don't want a province where patients linger in corridors or on waiting lists. According to the Financial Accountability Office, the current government projects an ongoing $62 billion shortfall in spending to the healthcare system over the next nine years. We cannot allow that to happen. We can and must do better than this. And if elected, we will ensure that we change much of what has gone wrong during the last few years. Thank you. Uh, unlike France, I'm not um, bilingual and can't take French uh, questions in French, and I apologize for that, but happy to answer any other questions uh, when they occur. Thanks. Great work. Rich, just before you jump in, I just want to assure the panelists who are doing a terrific job, thank you, that we're dealing with the questions. You don't need to respond to those. We're going to bring them all together and give you lots of opportunity to speak to them. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jim. And thank you, uh, uh, Marlene. And finally, we have Nathan Stahl, the Liberal Party candidate for Toronto St. Paul. Nathan? Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the RTO ERO for uh, having me today. And thanks to everyone who's uh, online watching. And thanks as well to the other representatives uh, from the parties, uh, Franz Jelenas and uh, Dr. Sprout, who, who are presenting uh, to everyone watching today. So I am uh, one of Ontario's uh, 150 geriatricians, and so uh, I have direct experience working within our healthcare system and during the pandemic in our long-term care system with older adults. And I bring that expertise and I bring that knowledge and I bring that career dedication to the Ontario Liberal Party and to our plan for how we will care for seniors. 
During the pandemic, I was also the assistant scientific director of the COVID-19 table. And one of my strongest uh, pieces of work and, and you know, time that I spent was actually on long-term care homes and, and investigating how we could better protect residents from COVID-19. And, and that led me to politics. We saw here today that uh, the conservative candidate did not show up uh, for today's uh, debate. And I think you know what we really saw during the pandemic and preceding that was that the Ford government hasn't shown up for seniors in our province of Ontario. And that's why I'm super proud to be the Ontario Liberal Party candidate for Toronto St. Paul's. And I'm really proud to represent the Ontario Liberal Party for Stephen Del Duca because they have accepted my vision of, of care for seniors and what we need to do to reimagine and transform our system. Uh, I also specifically want to thank the RTO ERO for hosting this. They've been an organization that has previously supported my academic work, uh, and I've had the opportunity to, to present at board meetings and at your AGM in the past and have been a longtime fan of your work and a, a big supporter of your organization. So the Ontario Liberal Party uh, plan for seniors is focused broadly on three main areas that I'm going to touch on today. Uh, the first is promoting aging in place. The second is strengthening our healthcare system and increasing competency in geriatric medicine. And the third is fixing and reimagining Ontario's long-term care system. So people talk a lot about aging at place and people talk a lot about this concept, but in order to actually implement this concept, this is gonna take a, a comprehensive and multi-dimensional approach to how we provide care to older adults in the community. There is no doubt that home is where older adults want to be. Uh, if you ask, ask older adults, and this has only gotten you know, more dramatic during the pandemic, almost all older adults want to remain in their homes for as long as possible. And in order to do so, yes, we need to strengthen our home care system. Yes, we need to hire and, and retain more home care workers, and Ontario Liberals are, are committed to doing so. But we also, as we do in geriatric medicine, need to look at the entire environment and the entire comprehensive situation which an older adult uh, sits in. And so that includes, yes, supporting unpaid family caregivers. We know that currently about 75% of all home and community care across the country is provided unpaid by family or friend caregivers. The majority of them are women. We need to, and we are committed to financially protecting them, but also providing them with the training and resources and, uh, and the skills and knowledge that they need to have to be able to provide the care they are doing without that. Uh, additionally, Ontario Liberals know that as you age, and if we want people to actually age in place, older adults are going to need to make adaptations to their homes, whether it's assistive, assistive devices or equipment that they may need, or even maintenance for their homes. And Ontario Liberals will provide seniors with some money to be able to do so because we know that those services fall outside the basket of OHIP. Um, and, you know, additionally, the, the other thing we really need to think of uh, when we talk about aging in place is that Yes, uh, aging is, is a triumph. Aging is not a failure. And so what we actually need to invest in and look at more comprehensively is the entire spectrum of care for older adults. And that goes from prevention all the way to palliation. So on the prevention side, we actually know that about two thirds of cases of dementia are preventable with, by targeting 13 independent risk factors at multiple stages of life. We know that hip fractures are devastating and seniors exercise programs pay off in, in spades when you actually invest in keeping older adults functional and working on false prevention. And so Ontario Liberals are committed to doing that as well, to invest in a system that starts with prevention and look at older adults as functioning healthy well-beings who need to maintain that state rather than looking at them as things that are unwell that we need to throw services at um, to, to keep them in their homes. It, it's a spectrum of care and we will invest along that spectrum. And relatedly, at the end of life, uh, we do a very poor job in Canada and Ontario at providing end-of-life care. About a third of all people die in acute care institutions. That's not where people want to die. And those statistics are far worse than places like the United States. And so Ontario Liberals are also committed to investing in palliative supports at the end of life so that people can transition between these different spaces on the continuum from being well and focusing on prevention in their home to requiring some services in a much more robust, stronger home care system. As they transition, they may need to move to a more supportive environment like a long-term care home, or for those who are able to die at home, they're able to die with dignity at home where they want to be with the palliative supports and services that they need and require. 
The second piece uh, after promoting aging in place uh, that, that Ontario Liberals would look at is, is really strengthening our healthcare system. And we can't get into everything that we would do in terms of healthcare reform. But specifically, I want to touch on something you brought up at the beginning, which is increasing competency in geriatric medicine. We know that there's about 150 geriatricians in the province. I'm one of them. If I'm so fortunate to be elected in June, my services, I, I won't be able to contribute you know, to that, that body of experts, but we know that we will never have enough geriatricians in our province uh, to be able to serve all the needs of older adults. And that's why we need to increase competency across all health professions. Yes, we need more geriatricians, but we also need orthopedic surgeons who are able to recognize delirium and to be able to manage it and work it up and treat it and have the consultative support of geriatricians, but they need to have that competency and, 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 and confidence themselves to be able to do that and that extends to allied healthcare professionals as well, like occupational therapists, social workers, physiotherapists. The truth is, many uh, healthcare professionals do not have mandatory geriatric training in, in the work that they're doing, and we need to be able to increase competency across our workforce. We know that COVID-19, that older adults have been disproportionately impacted. And we know that we're seeing right now that older adults are being neglected in, in the approach that we are taking to COVID-19 in our province of Ontario. We need to invest in public health. We need to give people the tools to be able to understand their COVID risk and the tools to be able to manage them. And Ontario Liberals are committed to doing so, whether it's investing in laboratory capacity to make testing more available, whether it's increasing the ability for people to get antiviral therapy and increasing the number of assessment centers that we have across our province, or whether it's on the other end, investing in a post-COVID clinics and care that people will need when they suffer from long COVID. And so, you know, looking ahead, we know that this virus is not going away. We cannot ask older adults to further isolate after two years. We need to be able to protect them and give them the tools they need so they are empowered to be able to live their lives after a very difficult two years of isolation for many older adults. And of course, to prevent those from dying when we know the majority of people dying still at this point are older adults. Finally, long-term care. Long-term care uh, was one of the most devastating tragedies our province has experienced in its history. We've had over 4,000 long-term care residents die of COVID-19, 13 staff members. This was a shameful, horrific uh, stain on our province history. And we need to act. We need to act with urgency and we need to act with, with vigor in terms of both fixing, but also reimagining our, our Ontario long-term care system. You know, one of the things Ontario Liberals are unambiguously um, committed to doing is also removing for-profit care from our long-term care system. And we will do that, but we also need to make long-term care places whether they're profit, not-for-profit, or municipal homes, places that people actually want to live and work. So yes, we will get rid of profit in our long-term care system, but we need to be able to attract and retain long-term care staff by paying them fair wages. We need to make their jobs doable by increasing the minimum hours of care that residents, uh, that each resident get to at least 4.1 hours of care. We need to build small home-like environments and Ontario Liberals are committed to doing so. We know that there are models like the greenhouse model uh, uh, that has better outcomes for residents, better outcomes for staff, and also had better COVID-19 outcomes. And, you know, additionally, we need to reconsider why, how many people actually need long-term care in our province. We talked about the number of people on our wait list. There's also a number of people that are living in long-term care homes that could be in our community with the proper services and supports. So we need to stop making long-term care the only option for people, invest in aging in place, when they do need long-term care, ensure that there are not-for-profit settings that are places that people want to live and work, that there's accountability uh, for people to hold up standards of care. Uh, and additionally, that these are small home-like environments that promote resident-centered care. A key finding of the COVID-19 Commission for the province of Ontario is that residents should dictate the schedule of care. And to do that, we need to invest in the sector, we need to fix it, but we must reimagine it as well. So that's our Ontario Liberal Party vision for aging and, and seniors in our province. And I'm really proud to deliver that on behalf of my party and uh, Stephen Del Duca. Thank you very much. I, uh, first of all, I wanna thank all three. I really wanna thank Franz Gerena from the NDP, Dr. Marlene Spruitt from the Green Party of Ontario, and of course, uh, Dr. Nathan Stahl from the Liberal Party. Uh, before we move on, uh, Rich and I are going to be uh, handling some of the great questions that are coming in. Uh, I do want to thank the panelists for being significant uh, to this day for us. 
uh, and for taking time to meet with us. It's really good of you to spend your time this way. There's lots of questions coming through from our webinar attendees, and that's good news. Uh, but first, I'm going to ask Anne Gerson to come back on and just remind people that they can ask their question on anglais ou en français, and we will help with either one. So, Anne, back to you. Merci, Jim. À nouveau, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Um, vous pouvez toujours poser vos questions en français ou en anglais en utilisant la boîte de questions et réponses au bas de votre écran. Si vous souhaitez que votre question soit posée à un panéliste spécifique, veuillez l'indiquer. Nous ferons de notre mieux pour poser le plus de questions possible. Um, hello again, everyone. We are still accepting questions, so please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions in English or French. If you would like your question to be asked, of a specific panelist, please indicate that. We will do our best to address as many questions as we can. Thanks. Thank you, Anne, very, very much. So let's go right to the questions. And of course, these will never be the easy questions. We save the hard ones for you. So let's start right in with uh, the concept of not-for-profit long-term care. Very appealing. How will that be structured? Does this mean another huge layer of governmental organization read cost that will be unwieldy to manage and to monitor. Let's start with uh, Franz. We started with you. We'll go right through in order on this one. Sure. Uh, first is I cannot turn my camera on. It says uh, my cam, I cannot turn it on because the host has stopped it. Oh, well, we'll deal with that. Charles will help, I think. <laughs> okay. But in the meantime, okay. <laughs> thank you, Charles. Um, so we all understand that the money we invest, the $4.6 billion we invest in long-term care, a lot of that money does not reach the bedside. The majority of the 78,000 beds in Ontario are for-profit. The government has announced uh, that 30,000 new beds will be built they have promised $6 billion to build those beds through most of them through for-profit company. So how many ways is this wrong? A for-profit company will build a home. We will, the taxpayer, pay them back 100% for the bill that they have. Plus, we will guarantee that every one of those rooms will be full all the time. And you have to remember that in long-term care, people pay for their rent. It is fixed by the province. The minimum you pay is over $2,000 for a basic room. You will pay $2,400 a month for a semi-private and close to $2,800 a month for a private room. All of that money goes to the private company who builds the home. That makes no sense. So first, really look at those contracts that have been given out for those new 30,000 beds. Um, if there hasn't been shoveled into the grounds, if we, we back out of those contracts, if it's in the taxpayer's interest to do this. For uh, the other um, that are already owned by the big chain, being Sierra, being Extendicare, um, really, we can look at what happened in, uh, Saskatchewan, who kicked out extended care from the province of Saskatchewan. They had done such a horrible, terrible job during the pandemic that they actually uh, kicked them to the door. I don't know if we will be kicking them to the door, but we will certainly be holding them accountable for all of their failings. Some of those failings led to really horrible living conditions for a lot of the residents of extended care, long-term care. I don't want to go against extended care. All of the for-profit are, are in the same boat. So really look, really look at them one by one. We give ourselves eight years. There's a plan in place uh, to migrate toward not-for-profit. We're not closing them. We're just making sure that all of the care that is being delivered at, at a first point will be delivered by not-for-profit. And slowly but surely, over an eight-year period, the building that are owned by for-profit company will be owned by either co-op, municipality, or not-for-profit organizations. 
We have many, uh, St. Joe's uh, owns a lot of homes. We have many not-for-profit organizations throughout uh, the province, and some new one could come forward uh, to do that. Okay, I'm going to move along and we're gonna to go to Dr. Spruitt and let her weigh in on that same issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat all the information about for-profit care yeah. that France so well described for us. I think the question was, uh, the questioner was concerned a little bit that there would be another layer of bureaucracy uh, right. in the process of doing this. And um, th that won't necessarily happen. So currently we have a large number of not-for-profit homes and they don't have a government bureaucracy looking after them. They're still inspected by the same government inspectors, but they are either owned by, in where I live, Frontenac County owns a, a long-term care home. And as France mentioned, there's other charitable organizations that own some of those homes. The board of directors for those homes are all volunteers. They don't take a profit and go away. They supervise and monitor those homes out of volunteer hours. And they use, as in the case of the municipality, some of the infrastructure that's already in the municipality to you know, do payroll and, and, and other things like that. So transitioning long-term, transitioning for-profit uh, care uh, providers out of the system doesn't have to have increased bureaucracy, but but it does need to take uh, place over time, so it's not disruptive to the system. Thanks. Thank you so much. I guess uh, we're going to go to Nathan next, but uh, you raised another issue we'll come back to, and that is real inspections, but we won't. I'll just leave that as a, a tantalizing morsel for later. So, uh, Nathan, can you weigh in on this, please? Yeah, so, you know, there's a large body of evidence going back several decades that that not for profit homes tend to deliver superior care uh, across a number of outcomes and my own research on COVID-19 uh, showed that long term for profit long term care homes had outbreaks that involved twice as many residents and had 78% more deaths. Um, so, but what we need to be clear about is that untangling and phasing out for profit is not going to be flipping a switch. This is going to be complex. And so I think the, the question posed is a reasonable one about how we do this and how we do this uh, respectfully. And when I say respect, I think we need to remember that there are people living in these for profit homes and there are people working in those for profit homes. And, you know, my own hospital, I supported I didn't care. There were people dying in there and there were staff that needed help. I supported a for-profit home was part of my hospital that had a severe COVID-19 outbreak. And I think as we do this, we need to think about residents and families and, and not make them feel that in this process that they are somehow uh, you know, living in a, in a poisoned home. And I know that staff felt that when I was uh, you know, attending to them, attending to or supporting them in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and I think the other thing we need to recognize in this is that because it will take time, and that's to your point, Jim, we need to have accountability because there are going to be some for-profit homes that are not going to disappear overnight. And we need to hold them to the standards, just like we need to hold not-for-profit and municipal homes to standards of care as we phase out for-profit. And I think the way forward is actually to look at how we accelerate uh, culturally uh, compet or community-based groups that want to get into the, the long-term care home sector, but don't have the resources and support. So you look at Advantage Ontario, they put forward a really reasonable proposition that we should be looking at a not-for-profit center of excellence to help these groups get in. And I think that's really important that we remember that, that there are people living and working in those homes right now. We need to do this in a really thoughtful way and we need to hold them to account uh, for the until we get that done. But hopefully we're able to support these community groups that want to put forward not-for-profit homes uh, you know, to, as we phase for-profit out of the system. Uh, excellent points. Thank you, all three of you. Uh, before I go to Rich, who's got a, a terrific question ready for you, Nous avons une question en français, and I'm going to turn to Anne to read the question in French and then give a very quick interpretation, and then we'll throw it out to all three of you. Okay, parfait. Uh, ma question uh, est la suivante. Que feriez-vous pour aider les aînés à recevoir les soins de santé dont ils ont besoin lorsqu'ils vivent à la maison, plutôt que d'être contraints de déménager pour recevoir des soins de santé dans des établissements de soins de longue durée? So in English now, what will you do to help seniors 
receive health care they need while living at home rather than being forced to move to long-term care facilities. Thank you. So let's go in reverse order. We'll start with you, Nathan, and then we'll work our way right back across the screen. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I've touched on a bit of this, but I, I really do think that that this is, you know, two things I talk about is considering the spectrum of care and older adult needs. So if we want to stay in home, yes, it's about increasing home care. Yes, it's about connecting them to the social supports and services they need, but it's also investing in things like prevention so that people can stay well in their home. You know, uh, JFK, the late JFK had a line that um, we've added years to life, we now need to add life to years. And I think that's really, you know, and similarly, my colleague at Mount Sinai, Samir Sinha, his seniors report in 2012 was called living longer, living well. So we need to invest in prevention for older adults so that they can prevent falling, we can uh, prevent or, or try and slow down cognitive decline. We, we do need to increase home care. We need to provide them with funds and the ability to make the adaptations to their homes that they need. And then I think there's real opportunity for innovation within our healthcare system. You know, we think about acute care as happening only within the walls of our hospital. There are models, models actually at UHN where I, where I do work, where there is a hospital at home model, where you actually don't need to take the senior out of their home to start an intravenous and provide them with antibiotics. Products. You could do that in their home and we can leverage things like home monitoring. So I actually do think it's a very comprehensive approach, much like we do in geriatric medicine, that considers all the needs uh, of the individual and situates them within their environment and their social environment. Thank you. Marlene. Oh, uh, yeah, the simple answer to allowing people to remain at home and not end up using long term care is just more home care services and a broader um, uh, extensive range of those. So lots of countries, as Nathan has mentioned, uh, offer a much more extensive. I've traveled in Britain and I see these huge vans driving up to somebody's back door in a little down a little farm lane and they're able to get there and uh, deliver services to people at home. And uh, that, that's all we need to do. And we just need to decide that that's our priority that services at home are prioritized because that's where people want to stay. Um, also, we really need to uh, have the funds um, to renovate homes so that they can be uh, remain accessible. So, you know, you've got uh, no ramps. Uh, we need to have funding so that you can put ramps in your home and getting in and out of your house is not a barrier. Uh, the other th uh, thing I think I mentioned in the first part of the chat about co-housing arrangements, sometimes people go into long-term care because they're alone. They're alone in their house. They don't have a spouse anymore. Uh, and they are fearful that something will happen and they may not be able to reach out. So these kinds of co-living arrangements where there may be um, a, a, a group of small apartments put together, a, a housing arrangement where they know there's a neighbor next door or somebody just checks on them on a regular basis will be beneficial as opposed to that individual. It often tends to be men more than women because they have no one to cook for them. That's that traditional old, older um, uh, sense. And that certainly was what I experienced when I was a family doc. Um, and so they need that option to, you know, group cooking arrangements or whatever that are not long-term care institutions. We need to be really innovative and flexible about different kinds of living arrangements. Thanks. Thank you very much. France. Je vais répondre à la question en français. C'est clair que tout le monde nous dit la même chose. On veut demeurer à la maison. Et je suis... Je suis parfaitement d'accord, j'en suis une qui est, qui est d'accord avec ça. Comment on fait ça? C'est en donnant le soutien dont la personne a besoin. Puis ça, ça ne peut pas être que tout le monde, j'ai donné l'exemple, moi dans mon comté, peu importe ce que tu as besoin, ce que tu reçois, c'est deux bains par semaine, c'est tout. Bien, c'est bien de valeur là, pour bien du monde, ce n'est pas ça dont tu as besoin. Euh, donc, c'est vraiment d'offrir le soutien dont la personne a besoin. Si le, le soutien dont la personne a besoin, c'est quelqu'un pour aller faire l'épicerie et préparer les repas, faire la vaisselle, bon, mais on lui envoie quelqu'un à 11 heures le matin, elle prépare le dîner, euh, fait la vaisselle, elle prépare le souper, tout ce que tu as à faire, c'est tu le mets dans le micro-ondes, euh, puis euh, est bonne pour le restant de la journée, bien, c'est ça que l'on offre 
peu importe où ils demeurent, peu importe leurs besoins. Et au fur et à mesure que les besoins augmentent, au fur et à mesure que les services augmentent, euh, des médicaments qui sont difficiles à prendre, euh, le transfert du lit à peut-être une marchette ou quoi que ce soit qui a besoin d'être euh, mis au niveau, quoi que ce soit. Donc, c'est vraiment d'avoir un système de soins à domicile solide. On en avait un système de soins à domicile solide dans les années 1990. Mike Harris, qui était le euh, premier ministre dans le temps, nous a dit que le système privé était pour faire les choses plus vite, mieux et moins cher. Euh, il n'y a rien de ça qui s'est passé. Euh, le système de soins à domicile est maintenant dominé par les compagnies à profit qui font beaucoup de profit, qui payent très mal leurs employés et qui offre un service de qualité douteuse, puis là, je suis généreuse en, en disant ça. Euh, donc, tout ça, ça peut changer. Tout ça, ça doit changer. Il y a des provinces ici au Canada qui font beaucoup mieux que nous, avec beaucoup moins de coûts. On doit le faire. C'est la bonne chose à faire. On se débarrasse du privé, on réinvestit et on rencontre les besoins. On n'a pas de de directives de deux bains par, par semaine, c'est tout ce que, ce que tu as. Um, so, uh, quickly, is, uh, I, I give the example of 1996 when Mike Harris decided that the private sector was going to do things better, cheaper, faster. Well, none of that happened. What happened is that for profit put bids in that made them look like they were Mother Teresa. They were going to do things so well in writing, but all they did is that put the not-for-profit out of business, they got the business, and then people had to reapply for their job at lower pay without uh, good uh, uh, benefits or condition, and they left the sector. The home care sector cannot recruit and return a stable workforce because the jobs are not good jobs. Remember my made them permanent, full-time, well-paid with benefits, and you fix a lot of home care. This can only happen once we get rid of the for-profit, and this is what we intend to do, because this is what Ontarians deserve. Other provinces are doing this much cheaper than us and much better than us. Thank you, Franz, for both languages. That's fantastic. I'm going to go back to Rich now. Rich. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as you, as everyone's well aware that uh, all the people here would be deemed likely to be older adults. So uh, Dr. Spruitt, I'll ask you first, uh, before going to the others, uh, What can older adults do to let the government know what they need? And the second part of that is, what can help older adult voices make a difference? Yeah, I'm actually, if you use the age of uh, 65, one of those older adults as well. Um, they need to speak out, they need to speak to their local representatives, and they need to vote. Uh, their opinion needs to be heard and they need to use whatever channels they can uh, to be heard. I, Nathan has reported lots of studies. Uh, France has reported, uh, you know, the, a lot of the funding dollars. Uh, you know, I think all of the three of panelists here on the, on the talk today are in agreement that, you know, more money needs to be put in the system, more services need to be delivered and uh, better paying jobs need to go to these uh, healthcare providers. And so uh, you as listeners need to um, let your local members of parliament and, uh, and choose who you vote for uh, based on those um, things that you uh, want to have happen. Thanks. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, uh, firstly vote. We already know that older adults are some of the most likely individuals to vote, uh, which is a fantastic thing. The other thing is, if you're able to get involved, uh, one of my, probably my best canvasser is actually an octogenarian. I'm going to meet her in an hour and a bit. Um, and uh, so there's the ability uh, to get involved. A lot of uh, election activities are actually outdoors, but there's also a lot of activities that go on behind the scenes that can be done remotely. And I think beyond those direct things, um, you know, I really want to see uh, in this election, and I think, you know, the Alzheimer's Society and, and events like this, to your credit, are trying to make seniors issues and long term care a ballot box issue. They are often not, and we need to keep them, keep shining the light on these issues to make sure that election outcomes 
are in the, you know, are, are directed towards and are also, you know, based upon what older adults need and want. And, and that is a key issue for this election. And I really hope that as we start to hear the noise and everything, uh, the roar towards June 2nd, that these remain ballot box issues that people talk about and focus on. Thank you, Nathan. And it's very interesting that uh, uh, what you just mentioned, I had to do in a uh, virtual meeting last night in Guelph uh, with respect to this, uh, how we can take an, a very active part. France? Um, I support what has been said by Dr. Spruce and Dr. Stahl, absolutely. Um, I want people to realize that we live in a democracy. If enough of us unite our voices, speak with one voice and demand something, we will get it. I cannot tell you how long it will take, but I can tell you that we will get there. Uh, so um, you getting together, uh, coming out with a strategic plan, whether you say what we want is the reform of long-term care or 4.1 hours of hands-on care, or we want better home care, it's, it's for you to decide, uh, but this is what we've been uh, talking about this afternoon. And then I, ca I, bring, I call it, bring more and more people into the tent. Um, if one good thing comes out of uh, COVID is that it has shined a light on long-term care. Long-term care is not sexy. It never grabs headlines unless it's for the wrong reason. But right now, a lot of Ontarians want our long-term care systems to do better. We have an opportunity that has never been there before because everybody saw what happened in long-term care and everybody said enough. We have to do better. Uh, so I, I thank you for uh, having this session this afternoon to adding your voice to the chorus and then bring more and more people into the tent and we will get there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all three of you. A great uh, response to that question from Rich. Uh, it's funny, I'm sitting here thinking as a grandfather of three, I'm thinking of the importance of really connecting this intergenerational connection that's missing from our whole system at this point. So just another little thing to sort of throw in there. But let's go back to one of the comments that Nathan mentioned uh, in his opening. And a question that comes from uh, the group out here. There's a significantly low number of geriatric health professionals uh, dealing with the growing senior demographic. Um, this questioner says this may in part be attributed to the complexity of care and the associated workload, what needs to be done to attract more specialists in geriatric health care, not just geriatricians, but as Nathan said, a whole range of those who serve uh, and provide health care to senior citizens, seniors. Nathan, let's let you weigh in on that first. But don't let them run away and be politicians. No, um, <laughs> uh, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. When I was in medical school uh, and I told people I wanted to go into geriatrics, people told me time and time again, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your talents. Um, so, uh, and, and that attitude uh, is unfortunately still a bit pervasive within medicine. I would argue it's improved a little bit, but it has not improved a lot. And, and that ageism is reflective of what we see in society. You know, ageism is the last socially, widely socially accepted form of discrimination that we do not call out and tackle in the way that we, we do for, for many other forms. And so unless we get to the root cause of the fact that people don't, to put it bluntly, don't care about old people the way they care about other populations in society, we are not gonna attract people to care for them. So I think tackling ageism is a key issue. And I think relatedly, because we've never built this critical mass, people aren't exposed to it. So by serendipity, I had my first clinical rotation was actually with a geriatrician. And I was planning to be a psychiatrist, but I loved what I saw and I loved the approach to care. So unless we actually build competency in the system so people can pass it on to other individuals, people aren't gonna be exposed to that care. I actually think, Jim, the complexity is one of the things that people love when they go into geriatrics, the comprehensiveness, the, the, the ability to spend 90 minutes with a patient and their family and understand the, the setting with, 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 that they live within. But we need to actually, uh, you know, 
when we're so overwhelmed and burnt out and, and overworked in our system, we are running out of those opportunities as well. And so that's a really important thing moving forward that we address some of the burnout in our healthcare system and we, we, we address some of the staffing shortages that we see. So we have the ability to, to get back to providing that direct care to older adults. But I would you know, really put it on ageism uh, and, and the fact that we still haven't built a critical mass within our system of competency, not just within geriatrics, but across all healthcare providers. So we'll go to you, Franz, because you can now be sandwiched between two medical practitioners. <laughs> there you go. It's a perfect place to be. I, I feel very secure. Um, so um, we need, um, we have very few in Ontario and we need more. The Northern Ontario School of Medicine, uh, where, where I live, is trying really hard to get a uh, placement for geriatrician in Northern Ontario. It is really hard to do. Uh, they need to do a residency and uh, we need them in the North. We only have two and, and, it's, and it's really difficult. So we have found that it works better if you surround them with a team. Um, so the geriatrician who works here, Dr. Clark, has a, a physiotherapist, she has occupational therapists, she has social workers, she has a speech therapists with her. She has, of course, nurses, RPN, uh, nurse practitioners. So, and everybody within that team um, supports her work, but basically supports older adults. Uh, it works really good, but we need to bring it a step further. We need to bring it a step where this specialization is recognized, not only for physicians, absolutely important. We need more of uh, people like Dr. Stahl, absolutely. But we also need the specializations to be recognized for, for physiotherapists. Physiotherapists can have a specialization in orth orthopedics, they can have, but they cannot have one in geriatrics. Uh, same thing with nurses. They can specialize in ICU, they, can speci they, they cannot specialize. We have to bring that forward so that it becomes an option and it is value. I agree with the ageism that exists at, in every part of our society, including our medical school and health, uh, and, uh, health professional schools. Um, so changing the models to have them work as part of this team and uh, changing the system so that occupational therapists, physiotherapists, can, uh, nurses can all have a specialty in gerontology would go a long way uh, toward meeting the needs of the people. Very good. Dr. Spruitt, your take I on agree this. with what my pre previous two colleagues have said, uh, but we'll add to that as a former family physician that we can't always, ex uh, we can never train enough specialists to be there for everybody across the province. And there are many family physicians who have taken a particular interest in geriatrics. The uh, College of Family Physicians of Canada has a certificate in special competency for uh, geriatrics, and it's becoming more funded um, or more available, I should say. Uh, but we also then need the governments to provide the funding. So if even if there were more people that wanted to do geriatrics, there's only so many residency positions, as Nathan will attest to. And so without opening up that funding, we can't even let more people into the system. The same with family doctors. If we don't provide the train, the opportunity to train and, and support the funding for that, then people, there, nobody can fill the spots because there are no spots to be filled. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, there was uh, a concern about palliative care, and the province actually initiated a whole set of trainings. I, I went for a full week of palliative care training, free, at the expense of the Ministry of Health. I don't see those kinds of programs happening anymore, and that's if we really want to encourage people to go, uh, because a, a physician will take a week out of their practice and their paid work to go to be educated. They're not paid while they're getting that kind of additional training. We need to set those opportunities up so that the doctors in practice can acquire those additional skills as their practice grows. You could put all the training you want into uh, medical schools now, but we have to remember that there's uh, a physician out there that's got another 30 years of practice ahead of them, and we have to offer that training and those opportunities to the individuals that are currently practicing as well. Thanks. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Rich, before I come back to you for a question, I'm going to go right back to the very first question that appeared in uh, the Q&A box right at 109. 
And uh, here it is. This relates to pharmacare. And it's a very clear question. There's evidence that some drugs and combination of drugs, call it the prescribing cascade, that affect seniors by making them seem like they have dementia. Will your ministry attack this problem by fleshing it out or revealing it and making the results readily available to all family doctors and caregiving situations? False dementia is a serious problem. So let's go with you, Marlene, right off the bat. Yeah, clinical issues such as that are actually very difficult for the government to get involved in. Uh, I'm not disputing that the problem exists. It's a difficult one for uh, the bureaucracy of the Ministry of Health to get involved. So the way to approach it again is more education. Uh, most physicians at somewhere in their training are, are taught that drugs cause side effects and looking at the side effect profile of a particular drug uh, can do that. We've all had individuals who were actually perfectly competent at home that ended up in hospital and became delirious and the hospital then thinks they're demented and that it's a permanent state and begin to look at placement opportunities. Uh, my mother being actually one of those. Um, so, uh, it, it's just ongoing awareness and ongoing training throughout the system. Thank Thanks. you, Nathan. Nathan, uh, weigh in yeah. on that. Uh, I smiled because the, the, uh, person who first described the prescribing cascade was Dr. Paula Rashan, who's my PhD supervisor. And of course has the RTO ERO geriatric chair. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is something we're very familiar with clinically and also in, in research. So, you know, there are several examples of this. And I think the one that, you know, was put forward, uh, you know, of people who are confused for having dementia, something that Dr. Sprud and I have seen clinically many times, a drug is started for, you know, someone goes on a, a diuretic that makes them pee for maybe heart failure. Then somebody thinks that they have urinary incontinence and puts them on an anticholinergic medication. They get confused and, and they end up, yes, it's that cascade where they end up getting misidentified as somebody who may have cognitive impairment. I agree with Dr. Sprout that the sort of direct tools to ta attack a prescribing cascade may be challenging, uh, you know, within the, with, you know, direct tools from the government, but I think there are several ways to attack that. Uh, one is, you know, increasing competency in geriatric uh, medicine, as we spoke about across the spectrum, uh, so that, you know, multiple people can be the eyes and ears for patients, their home care worker, their pharmacist, not just their physician. Um, you know, the other thing is caregivers as well, is providing them with the knowledge and education, the family caregivers to recognize when something's gone wrong. You know, in geriatrics, I teach trainees, but I'm not so sure it's well known, you know, to the general public as much that the number one, two, and three issues in geriatrics are almost always medication medications or medication side effects. And so we need to, you know, make that sort of public awareness and education much more, uh, you know, translated to the general population. I think government can't help with competency, with education, uh, and with empowering caregivers with that knowledge to be able to identify those issues. Okay, last word on this pharmacare issue, France. Uh, uh, I would say the government has a bit of a role to play. Um, some of you who follow Queen's Park, you will have seen the Auditor General's report on long-term care in which she, uh, she puts it out uh, that 10 medications that should never be given to older people, so it's a never medication, should never be, uh, were being given in half of the population that lived in long-term care. And one of the symptoms was, well, it made them really, really quiet and easy to care for. Uh, it took away who they were. Um, the Auditor General uh, made recommendations to make sure that the never, the 10 medication that should never be given, that they uh, should not be available to long-term care home because they are being prescribed uh, to uh, this population, which is mainly 90% and up elderly. So the government has a role to play in following the role, the um, recommendation of the Auditor General. And then I agree with, but a lot of it will come down to interdisciplinary care so that when a new medication is given, the nurse knows about it, the care worker knows about it, the, uh, the, the family knows about it. So we all have an eye out to see, is this changing who the person is? Yeah, a great answers to this question from all three of you. The real missing factor is who's the integrator? Who knows all of these medications and who can raise the alarm? That's a rhetorical question. That is a big deal. Yeah, I see your point. 
<laughs> uh, Rich, I'm going to go to you, Rich, for the next I question. I see Franz still pointing at us, but there's pharmacists involved. Oh, uh, big time. Every long-term care home has a pharmacist that's supervising medication, so they yeah. also have a role to play. Indeed. Indeed. And there's Rich. A, thanks, Jim. And there's a group that we associate with uh, who are greatly involved in this called Choosing Wisely Canada. Um, uh, a very important group that people should understand about and know. Now, all the panelists today addressed the transition from for-profit long-term care homes to not-for-profit long-term care homes. But unfortunately, there are barriers sometimes put up with respect to these. And at the present time, many Ontario uh, grant guidelines are not allowing not-for-profit groups to apply for these grants. So what are the strategies that not-for-profit groups can use to access the Ontario government grants? Uh, well, we'll start with uh, France. I guess the short answer to this question is say goodbye to Mr. Ford and the Conservative government, and you will be on a path where for-profit won't be at the front of the line, his rich buddies, won't be dictating who gets access to provincial money and who doesn't. It is right now, it is almost impossible for a not-for-profit to apply to uh, get licensed for long-term care beds. It is really, really set up for big corporations to make a ton of money off of this. Uh, long-term care is an example. Home care is another example. Uh, we see you know, like the underfunding of our public health system, of our public hospital system. This is by design. This is by design because once enough of us say this doesn't work anymore, then we will be open to privatizations, to having private surgical suite, to having uh, private just about anything that right now our hospital do for free. Um, so this is by design and this is by design by the government we have now i must say though that when the liberal government was in place they allowed the privatizations of a lot of uh, services that used to be solely in our hospital if you look at colonoscopy clinic if you look at sleep lab if you look at uh, mammogram um, i mean those always used to be in our hospital they allow the privatizations of that it has to stop and thank you Franz. For that very extensive response. Uh, Dr. Spruitt? Yeah, nothing much more to add. So uh, any kind of grant needs to be open for uh, not-for-profit organizations. End of story. I, I think we're probably all in agreement there that um, we need to remove Ford and uh, a lot of these things will change. Okay, and Nathan, your strategies, suggested strategies? Yeah, so the, you know, the, the not-for-profit, it's definitely not a level playing field. Uh, and so one of the things I mentioned was the Advantage Ontario's pro pro proposal to have a not-for-profit center of excellence. That would allow community groups to get legal support, to get real estate support, to get actual counsel to actually be able to compete for these bids and to have the tools and resources necessary to set them up for success. We also have to reserve some of these grants for not-for-profit uh, agencies and make sure that those who they're going to because they're not going to be able to compete if you're a community organization and you don't have real estate wherewithal and the tools and knowledge necessarily like the, the big developers have you are not going to be on a level playing field and the other thing you know particularly in a place like toronto st paul's in toronto is land is a big issue uh, as we we seek to expand this we are landlocked in a lot of ways and we need to look at how we access land to be able to support these not-for-profit uh not-for-profit centers i think the final thing we need to recognize here is um, you know, the way that the Ford government contorted the findings of the COVID-19 commission, there was a real emphasis on what they called mission-driven care. And, and that was care that was, you know, operated on a, on a, not, you know, the intention of it, if you read the text, was really not, you know, care that is not meant to be set up to, to profit off of. The way that they contorted it within the bill they put forward was almost anything could fit into mission-driven care. And so you're seeing that a lot of the new, um, you know, licenses that have been giving out to long-term care homes claim that they are providing mission-driven care but are still behind that sort of facade 
for profit operators that are able to successfully secure these bids. And I think, you know, that we need to come back to some of the really thoughtful findings of the commission as well, and, and, and not contort the findings uh, with, for the interest of the for profit sector. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, last week, we had a great discussion with your with colleagues of yours uh, on seniors issues. And one of the issues that kept cropping up is this notion of naturally occurring retirement communities, the NORC issue. Um, that's not the question, it's just more a comment than anything. There are aging populations in apartment buildings or in small neighborhoods that could use services. And it strikes me that that's a natural area. You don't need land, you've already got them uh, in, a, in a spot where services can be brought to them. I love your notion, Marlene, I think you mentioned it in Britain, this whole notion of you know, a transportation system coming in, a, a, a care unit coming to a, an area and providing some of the services required, which much like we did with uh, uh, the early years childcare in Peel when I was there. However, nous avons une question en français encore. So Anne, can I uh, ask you to read the question, please? Oui, bien sûr. Alors, la question est comment assurer que les services en français soient disponibles dans les résidences qui sont dans des régions désignées. So, in English, how do you ensure, ensure that French language services are available in residences that are, that are in designated regions? Thanks. So, let's go with you, Marlene, please. We just need to mandate it. So, you know, uh, an individual, as I talked about, there's a diversity. Individuals as they age uh, need to have services in the language that they've lived in. And uh, this is a bilingual province and there are many French designated areas. Uh, France knows this uh, landscape much better than I do, I'm sure. And uh, we need to actually hire uh, for uh, uh, a, a number of people that are bilingual. We always had trouble when I was working in the North finding enough professionals that were bilingual, even when I tried to hire public health nurses. And so one of the things uh, that the Northern School, Northern Ontario School of Medicine has done is actually designate uh, that they will always in their intake class have a certain number of uh, Francophone individuals, as well as a, a, a number of ind Indigenous. That perhaps needs to happen beyond the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, that we just need to choose people, it, it just it's a it's a bonus if you have uh, knowledge of another uh, language, particularly French. But there are some areas of Toronto. Uh, I'm sure Nathan will refer to them, where uh, the Mandarin or or uh, some other Asian language uh, might be uh, necessary. In Sault Ste. Marie, there was. Um, a Finnish uh, long-term care home, and there were some providers there that spoke Finnish. Uh, and so there are a number of organizations that have done that, and then they're in communities where they're more likely to find people with those languages. Uh, but we need to do more all across the board when we're recruiting and training healthcare providers to try and select for those that have uh, linguistic um, uh, uh, skills. Thanks. Thank you. France, to be played. Bien, euh, comme francophone en Ontario, nous avons la loi sur les services en français. La loi sur les services en français nous garantit que si c'est un service offert par le gouvernement de l'Ontario et que l'on demeure dans une région désignée, on a droit à ce service-là en français. Euh, il y a un ministère, le ministère des Affaires francophones, qui est en charge de ça. Et je vous dirais que malheureusement, elles ne sont pas très actives à vérifier que la loi soit suivie. On parle ici de gens euh, qui ne sont pas capables souvent euh, de demander même qu'ils veulent des services en français. Tu es dans une maison de soins de longue durée, tu as attendu des mois avant d'avoir une place dans une maison de soins de longue durée, tu t'attendais à ce que tu sois servi en français et que tu ne l'es pas. Euh, la famille n'ose pas se plaindre, le patient n'ose pas se plaindre parce qu'il y a peur de rétribution et euh, la loi n'est pas... Euh, supervisé suffisamment pour assurer. Euh, tout ça, ça doit changer. Euh, notre plateforme sur les services en français va vous parler d'une réforme de la loi sur les services en français pour la rendre beaucoup plus proactive, donc ne pas avoir à attendre que les gens fassent une plainte, mais aller vérifier sur le terrain que le service est disponible en français. The French Language Services Act 
uh, gives Franco-Ontarian the right to services in French from the government um, if they live in a designated area. Uh, right now, it is very much complaint driven, but a resident of long-term care and their family are often not in a position to complain against their long-term care home because they're afraid of retribution. The government has to play a proactive role to make sure that those services are available. And right now, with the government in place, they are not doing it. Thank you, France. Uh, Nathan. Yeah. Not, not too much new to add to that. I agree with what's being said. I think the other thing uh, is that, you know, I've seen this where you actually, because we have not invested in uh, homes that are actually community driven and mission driven, you end up with individuals who actually are not understood by their care providers. And it's really tragic. Sometimes there's somebody around that, that comes, but because of the crunch to get people out of the hospital and they may end up in a long-term care home where, where all of their care providers are, you know, or only a very few numbers speak their language. So it, yes, we must do it because of the laws that, that, that dictate around Francophone services, but we also have to ensure that we match people's languages and cultures to the homes that they're getting into, but also that we provide spaces that have competency, that help cultural competency to provide care for those individuals. And that extends beyond language and culture. Uh, you know, there are 2SL uh, LGBTQ plus individuals who actually go back into the closet when they enter long-term care yeah. homes because, of, because, you know, we know that these are not spaces that are necessarily set up to be welcoming to them. So it, it, the French language is critically important, but it extends beyond that as well. Uh, thank you so much. Such such an important uh, uh, such an important question. Um, uh, I'm going to do one last question and then go to Rich for probably the final question. Um, a number of uh, the people who joined us today are deeply concerned about the issue you've already raised, and that is the number, the training, the rate of pay for um, PSWs. I can recall maybe seven or eight years ago when the government of the day added three or $4 an hour um, uh, to PSWs. But the issue still is, what is it that you can do, your government can do to make this an attractive position? I know that some of you have already spoken about full-time, in one spot, well-trained. What else would you add to this? Because just like early childhood educators, PSWs, uh, are, it's not a really attractive place to be or, or career at this point. So can we go with you, Franz? Come here. Sure. I, I would disagree a bit that PSW is not an attractive place to be. It all depends. When my hospital, Health Sciences North, put out an ad for one full-time position, they get about 500 applicants. Wow. There are a lot of people who are PSW who want full-time, well-paid jobs with benefits, with a pension plan, with sick days, and with a workload that a human being can handle. Bring that into long-term care. Bring that into home care and problem solve. It's not that we don't have enough, we could always use more, but we have a lot of them that don't work in their field. Uh, the, sol the solutions are there. In our platform, you will see on day one that we get elected, they will get a raise of $5 an hour right off the bat to, uh, to bring their salary. Then we will let the unions uh, uh, do, do their job, but we will mandate just like was done in the in, way back in the 80s, we will mandate full-time, permanent full-time jobs. More and more of them work for temp agency. The temp agencies pay them more than the nursing home that they work in. They will have a casu casual job because none of them are part-time. They will have a casual job in their long-term care, and then they'll take a job with plan B, work in the same long-term care, and make more money. How could that be? Why is it that it is okay to pay the, the staffing agency, but it's not okay? Because the long-term care home owns the staffing agency and makes money off of it. They own the drug distribution system and make money off of it. The way that the private sector makes money just would make you sick as you start to look into it. But for PSW, there are good jobs to be had 
there are lots of Ontarians, people in Ontario who want to do that job, who went to school to do that job, that cannot make ends meet. Bring in pay equity, bring in permanent full-time jobs, and a lot of the problem goes away. Terrific, thank you. Marlene, your comments? Yeah, I echo uh, Francis' comments as well. The PSWs that work in the system want to be there. Most of them have chosen it because they like to work with elderly people. And uh, the trouble is the disparate kinds of pay scales from one institution to another. So we're also getting um, them jumping, job jumping, basically. So Health Sciences North has 500 applicants. And uh, if you're paid poorly at a for-profit home, you quickly move on to the place where you get paid better. So getting the for-profit sector out of home care and out of long-term care will solve this problem dramatically. Um, the county home where I uh, live in Frontenac County, I saw ads for them. Their base rate is up $25, $30 an hour for a PSW. And so those are fair wages. And then people stay in those jobs yep. and they have the continuity that we need. Um, the other unfortunate thing, though, I think is that some of this is historic and it is somewhat gender based. And so it happens in the healthcare sector and some of the other social service sectors. It doesn't happen in the police force, which traditionally was a male dominated profession. I don't think there's any part time police officers You get a job or you don't, you know, it, there are no privatization of that sector. And so I think that some of the resistance about changing this is just caught up in uh, history. Thanks. Thank you. Nathan, last word on this topic. Yeah, Jim, to add to Dr. Spruit's comment, I think it's gender, but I also think it's racism as well. About 40% of PSWs are actually visible minorities. And so this has been a you know, historically long-term undervalued profession. Um, everyone has raised some really good points. I just wanted to add, uh, you know, a couple things. So that wage differential where hospital PSWs are paid more than uh, long-term care workers who are paid more than home and community care workers makes no sense. And you're just driving people along that spectrum. They're, you know, they have to follow the money. We know that Ontario released in the summer of 2020 a, P a staffing survey for long-term care. Uh, yeah. You know the the part-time workers want many of them want more full-time work. So you know uh, France. Uh, uh, outline the 75% full-time. There is a proportion of workers that do want to be part-time, about 25%. We know that from the staffing survey, but increasing to that 75% threshold makes a lot of sense. And one of the really perverse things about Bill 124, which I know both the New Democrats and the Greens have also committed to repealing uh, should they form government, is that it has actually capped the ability of not-for-profit homes and not-for-profit interests to pay higher wages, while the for-profit interests have been able to do so. So you're actually siphoning resources away from the not-for-profit sector. So, you know, go, you know, investing in not-for-profit care, paying people fair wages with benefits and working on that attrition problem, which I think there is a real gender and racism component to why we haven't done that, are ways that we can incentivize people to stay in the career. And additionally, it's not just about pay and benefits. We need to build them career ladders and think of PSW and personal support work as a career that we really do value and we want them to advance in that profession and chosen career. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, I can't say that we've actually had you on the hot seat, but perhaps the last question coming from Rich will do that. Uh, you've been terrific so far. So off we go to Rich. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Jim. And as you mentioned, this is going to be the last question. And, and we appreciate what the panel has done uh, greatly with respect to this. But as we mentioned before, <clears throat> We are deemed to be older adult, uh, older adults, and a, a large focus on what RTO ERO has done in the past two years has focused on social isolation, and unfortunately, the government uh, demands a certain degree of technology with respect to forms that have to be filled out, whether it be vaccinations. Uh, obtaining certain uh, uh, documents. And what we have to know is what will the Ontario government do to assist people from becoming socially isolated? And we'll start with uh, you, Nathan. Thanks for the question. Um, 
you know, we, we know that social isolation and loneliness uh, carry mortality risks that are equivalent to smoking about 14 cigarettes a day for several decades. So this is not a benign risk, social isolation and, and, uh, and loneliness. This is a, a severe risk that has been exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly because in the province of Ontario, we have had to endure longer lockdowns than other places because of inaction and a lack of proactive, uh, you know, policy to, to stamp things out early on. And so seniors and older adults and other people with disabilities have had to isolate more than I, I would argue many of them had to. And I think right now they also feel that they're in a situation where they're being told to live with COVID-19, but not being provided with the data and the tools to be able to understand risk and to protect themselves. So, you know, to answer your question, this is a critically important issue. It impacts mortality, it impacts quality of life. It also impacts, we've shown this in our own research, uh, the need for long-term care and, and acceleration of cognitive and functional decline. So addressing social isolation and loneliness is critical. I think there's a number of ways to do that. One, there are models, and some of these frankly happen more at the municipal level, but we can uh, encourage and also incent municipalities to do that is to build age friendly communities. Uh, there are examples, the WHO has the World Health Organization has put forward a model of what age friendly communities look like. It's where you put a park bench and how often you space it so someone could sit down when they're walking. It's how you build your transportation system. To your point, it's not having vaccine hunger games and have people you know, go online to try and secure an appointment through eight different computers when we know that disadvantages old their adults. We need to build age-friendly communities. I think the government can play a role in that. I think additionally, people don't recognize the risks of social isolation as well as the prevalence of it. And there are a number of ways. The UK is actually a leader in this in some respects. They actually put a minister in charge of social isolation and loneliness. And Joe Cox, who was one of their members of parliament who was tragically murdered, they named the Commission on Social Isolation and Loneliness after Joe Cox. And you know, there is a way to actually, the, much the way that we prescribe medicines, there's a, something called social prescribing, where you actually, as a clinician, prescribe things that are non-pharmacological, not medicine, that actually work on, on uh, loneliness and social isolation. The problem is, much like you need a well-stocked pharmacy full of medicine if you prescribe medicines, you need a well-stocked community of services and supports for people to be able to prescribe something for them in the community. So really investing in age-friendly communities, investing in on-the-ground supports for individuals that will work on prevention, working on adding those you know, the, adding that quality to life are things that we can do. And I think Dr. Sprout raised a really, um, you know, important issue early on about intergenerational opportunities. Uh, there's intergenerational opportunities for housing for individuals. We know that many older adults are overhoused, many younger adults are underhoused, and there's opportunities hopefully coming when we do out of COVID-19 to bring back together opportunities for young people and old people to co-mingle and to understand each other's needs because they both really have suffered during COVID-19. Thank you, Nathan. And I just wanted to put a, a little bit of a plug in here for uh, the RTO ERO Foundation in that what they have done to assist uh, socialization, isolation and loneliness is they have a program entitled Chime In where individuals from across Canada can meet on a weekly basis and discuss a variety of issues. But uh, <clears throat> the government, from your opinion, France, what can be done? A lot can be done. Uh, so you will see the platform for the NDP. We talk about health promotion. We talk about disease prevention. We talk about primary care, home and community care, mental health and addiction, long-term care, uh, palliative care. And through all of this, we all know uh, that health promotion is a place where the government has to invest. Uh, preventing loneliness Preventing uh, social isolation is something that the government, actually governments, every level of government has tools to do. So what you'll see in our platform is an expansion of community health center, Aboriginal health access center, nurse practitioner led clinic, community based family health teams, so that they can have program uh, such as uh, uh, friendly lunch. Uh, such as a drop-in, uh, such as uh, maybe meditation or yoga or ways so that when you go see your family physician or your nurse practitioner and she starts or he starts to see that you're getting pretty isolated and then she can bring you right down the hall and say, 
why don't you come and have lunch here on Wednesday? Why don't you come and uh, take part in the uh, uh, play cards or whatever is available that day uh, that that meets uh, the community needs? Uh, so a, a, a lot of that can be prevented. Um, I certainly uh, uh, things like uh, Meals on Wheels offers a little bit of of a visit but they are often the ones who can tell you that such and such is getting very lonely. Uh, this should be uh, shared with their primary care team so that we take it seriously. So how can the government help fund more community health center? Make sure that health promotion disease prevention is available so that you plan for it. And uh, I fully agree at the municipal level, age-friendly community makes a huge, huge difference. We know how harmful it is. The government has a role to play to help people make decisions that will help them stay well. And uh, it's in our platform. I hope you read it. Uh, thank you very much, France. And the final word goes to you, Marlene, on the issue of social isolation and loneliness. Thanks. I think my colleagues have uh, reiterated uh, most of the ideas quite well. The other uh, thing that I will add, in addition to Franz's comment about community health centers, that not all uh, social activity happens through the health care system. So um, our governments have been kind of stingy with small organizations. So, you know, the local Lions Club that puts the park benches out in the community uh, needs to be supported. And it often supports the Saturday morning pancake breakfast that's just open to everybody. And those small organizations have not have had their funds dry up and are not getting the grants that they used to get from the government. Uh, curling clubs, golf course, not golf courses because they're usually prof, more profit, uh, but other the pickleball court, all of the other activities that have been put in place for seniors uh, that uh, encourage them to go out. Now that's been a problem in the pandemic. The other thing we need to do is support our libraries because our libraries also help get internet access and training to seniors to get on the internet and be able to use the technology. And that, uh, I mean, what would we have done in the pandemic uh, 20 years ago, if we didn't have Zoom and the internet, I think the loneliness would have been much worse. So um, a, a number of things, and uh, I think we're running out of time, so I won't um, add much more. Thanks. Uh, these, these have been brilliant moments. I'm so glad that you all joined us. Uh, what I learned in the last couple of minutes, well, first of all, I know completely that the public library and the audible books that are available have, have been a lifesaver over the pandemic. I knew smoking, or sorry, I knew sitting was the new smoking. Now I also know that social isolation is the new smoking. There are several things that are the new smoking, but uh, I, I do wanna thank, first of all, I wanna thank the hundreds of people who signed on to this um, session, this workshop, uh, a great opportunity to hear from three very articulate speakers. So Franck Jelena from the New Democratic Party of Ontario, Dr. Marlene Spruitt, from the Green Party of Ontario and Dr. Nathan Stahl of the Liberal Party of Ontario. I thank you for being here. You've been uh, amazing and answered the questions rather brilliantly. Um, let me just say though, uh, a, a word of thanks. There are people in the background who've been doing all kinds of monitoring of the questions and getting them all set. So a thanks to them as well for that support. Listen, there is still time to register for our last of three virtual town hall events next week. Here's the ad and the topic. Oh, just the little issue of environmental stewardship uh, next week, which uh, should be quite interesting and entertaining as well, just like this one. Uh, to register, you just go to our events page on the website and you're in. Um, as I mentioned, this, this session has been recorded and within early next week, I would think you'll get a, a, an opportunity to get the link to our YouTube channel. You can always find it on our website. Uh, and you'll receive updates and notifications when those uh, new videos are added. So we'll send an email to you specifically um, with the YouTube link, and you can access uh, this recording and you can share it with your friends and neighbors who need to know that well before the 2nd of June. Again, thank you uh, to our panelists and thank you to those who joined us. And we'll be looking forward to uh, next week as well. Take care and enjoy the rest of the day. 
Thank you for inviting us. You're welcome. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Thank you.